My name is Yaakov Fein, and uh, today we'll talk about Angular. Uh, at a Java conference, it's kind of a surprise that so many people are interested, and thank you for coming. About myself, I am also a Java developer. Um, currently, I'm working on the second edition of the book, uh, Angular Development with TypeScript. There is a discount code down there if you are interested to get a MIA edition, we are still working on the second edition. And I'm gonna have a couple of um, a couple of codes for people who ask interesting questions for 100% discount. So what, what are we planning to do today? I'm gonna be creating an app. If you want to participate, if you have a computer with you, you can, we can turn it into a workshop I'll be doing it on my computer, but I prepared instructions for you, and I'll show you the site where to download it from. As a matter of fact, you can see it down there at the bottom of each slide. Uh, all, all the slides and all the instructions that uh, you would need and I will use are there. So if you, if you want, let's do a workshop instead of a session. What's the plan? I want to show you how you can quickly start the project with Angular. Major concept, I'll explain you, the major concept of this framework. And then we will, we will be applying the concept as we learn them to developing an app. So my goal is to, to finish the app within these three hours and it should be more than enough for this app. In terms of slides, I have slides but it's going to be a smaller portion of this presentation. Most of the time we'll be developing an app. So what's Angular framework? We are talking about the latest and greatest framework from Google, which is at version five as of last week. And I, this is what I'll be using in this, uh, in this presentation. It's a framework that will have an effect on the front-end development uh, as big as Java Spring Framework had on the, on the server side. On the, especially for the enterprise developers, this will be the uh, framework of choice. It's a component-based framework. It's not an MVC framework. It allows you to cleanly separate code that you write and the template. A template is a UI that the user will see. It supports dependency injection. Most of you are Java developers, you know what it is. It supports client-side navigation with a powerful router. Client-side meaning the user clicks on the menu, on the links, and within the app that is already downloaded, uh, the user is navigated from one place to the other. It has an integrated library RxJS, even though it's a separate library for reactive programming. If anybody is familiar with RxJava, it's a similar concept. And you can program either in TypeScript language or in JavaScript language. We'll be using TypeScript. This is recommended language to develop in Angular, and Angular itself is written in Angular, and Angular teams suggest using TypeScript. And I can tell you, I, I work with uh, Angular for more than two years, and it's a great productive language, especially if you compare it with JavaScript. Now let's see what it means to be component-based framework. If you look at this Twitter page, let's say you would need to develop something like this in Angular. When you look at it, you need to split this UI into components, in your mind. And in this slide, you see how you can possibly do this. Any front end in Angular consists of, a, of components. It's a tree of components. You have a top level component, which has child components. Children may have grandchildren and so on. So in this case, with this um, fat uh, red border, you see a top level component. Inside, you have a nav bar on top. On the left, you have a component for user profile, another component for trends. In the middle, you have on top a component for new tweets. Uh, then you can have multiple components rendered for each tweet. On the right, you 
who to follow, some keywords, and so on. Inside the, inside the component for the tweets, you may have other uh, components, which will be like grandchildren of the root, uh, comments and retweets, and so on. Each of these is a component. When you will be developing in Angular, it's very easy to split the work between the team member. Each person can develop different components and we bring them together. Angular is a great fit for creating so-called single-page apps. What is a single-page app? It's an app that doesn't, uh, that is not refreshed. The, the entire page doesn't get refreshed. Imagine Gmail, for example. The app is uh, in your browser. Once in a while, you will get a new email, so a new line comes in in the inbox. But the entire page is not refreshed. In any uh, single page app, or SPA as we call it, you will have an area that may be changing. Not the entire page, but the area. So that area is called router outlet. Like in this example, let's assume that the toolbar stays the same, the left uh, component is the same, the right component is the same, but in the middle, for example, if you click on the notifications menu on top, the middle portion will be changed. You will see notifications that were uh, mentioning you. So router will replace the content of that area called router outlet with another component. Why? Because user clicked on the menu item. And the app that we're going to be building today is this. We'll create a simple front end for an online store. The landing page will look like this. Up on top you have a, you have a toolbar. And then you have, on the left, you have maybe some advanced search component. In the middle, you have a bunch of products that are on sale in your uh, in your online store. In this case, I am using these gray areas for simplicity. There is a site called placehold.it, which will just serve you a rectangle of certain sizes you want, so it's easier to, to, to demo something. Underneath, you see the title, the short description of the product, and if the user will click on the title, we will replace it using router. We will replace it with product detail, screen on the title that you are interested in. That's the goal for today. What are the main artifacts of Angular Framework? A component, as I said. That's the main guy. It's a class. Class with an annotation. In TypeScript, they call them decorators. But if you are Java developers, it's, think of it as an annotation. It's a metadata about your class. Not, not necessarily only about the class, but for components, is about the class. So a component is a class with UI. Where do you specify UI? In a decorator. A directive is also a class with a different decorator or orientation, but it doesn't have its own UI. It can manipulate UI of other components, but it doesn't have its own. A service, it's a class. It's a class where you will put your business logic. Services often used for communication with the server, for bringing data, and services are injected into your component or into other services using DI, dependency injection. Pipe, it's a simple function, a transformer. Say you want to format, format the currency or the date, so you can use like a vertical bar, which, which is a pipe, and then specify the name of your pipe. Module. Angular module is just, a, again, it's a class which lists all artifacts that belong together, that belong in this module. You'll see how this works. Here's an example. In this example, if you look at the last line of this slide, you see that it's a class. But it is annotated with et and g model. So in there we have a section of declarations, in there you will be listing all components that belong to this module. In this case it's just only one app component class. In import state, in import section you will specify which other modules you may need in yours. In this case it's a browser module, forms and HTTP. I can guess by looking at it that this app needs to use forms and it needs to make HTTP requests. 
If you use any of the, of the class names over here, you need to import them on top. You need to say where in which uh, files they are implemented. And the bootstrap is a parameter that says which component out of many, typically you have many components, which one is the main one, to bootstrap the top level component so it can bring its children. And how do you install Angular and its dependencies? You will be installing it using NPM. NPM is a node package manager. So what you would need to do, you need to install Node.js on your computer, which comes with NPM. Again, if you're a Java developer, you can think of NPM as a Maven. So you will specify dependencies, but you will be installing them not with Maven, but with NPM. Node.js.org has 400,000 or more packages that people from around the world submit over there as an open source product. Angular itself is there. So you'll do npm install and Angular. Or you can use a generator, which we will use, Angular CLI, that will generate for us project, and it will specify a list of dependencies. And I'll show you how to do this. Now let's talk about versioning, how this framework is versioned. There is something in the JavaScript world called semantic versioning, meaning that the version of your product will consist of three digits. The main one, the first one, is about the major version. As of now, it's version 5. So if version 6 will be released, and Angular will be releasing version 6 in six months, twice a year they will be releasing the next version, it means that you may have some breaking changes. So you need to be careful, you need to think, do I want to, to upgrade to version 6 or maybe not? The second digit is a minor release. Minor release means no breaking changes, maybe they added some features, but everything will work. So it's pretty safe to go from 5.0 to 5.1, and so on. And the third digit is about patches, bug fixes. So it's, again, it's no, no break, breaking changes over there either. Again, now we have 5.0.0. Package JSON. Every project that you will uh, create in Angular will have its own file called package JSON. Once again, if you are a Java developer, think of POM XML. This is where you specify dependencies. Package JSON has two important sections. It has more than two, but two are the most important ones: dependencies and dev dependencies. Dependencies is a list of packages with their versions that you require to be deployed in production with your app. Dev dependency is a list of packages that are required for developer on developer's machines. They don't need uh, to go uh, into production. For example, the last line, TypeScript. TypeScript is a language that will be converted into JavaScript anyway. So when you will de be deploying the app, the, the app will be in JavaScript, even though you write it in TypeScript. So you don't need it in Pro Machine, right? Because by that time, you don't need uh, TypeScript anymore. And Angular CLI, it's a command line interface. It is created for helping developers to jumpstart the app, to generate the first app with basic module components, with all dependency, with package JSON, and so on. So that's the first reason to use it, to, to quickly create a new project, and after that you will be adding components as needed. Not only that, even after the project is generated, you will need to generate maybe components, services, you will need to do builds to bundle up together multiple files, Angular CLI will help you with that. It comes with a dev server, so you will be bringing the app using the dev server that comes with Angular CLI. How do you start with Angular CLI? You need to install it, first of all. How do you install it? With NPM, as everything else. In this example, in the middle, you see this command NPM I. I is the short for install. NPM, install. This is what you type on your command line. At Angular slash CLI. And minus G means that you want to install it globally. If I wouldn't use minus G, it would install it in my directory. And of course, in some cases, you want to have a specific package installed for your project only. 
In some cases, when you use tools that you are planning to use across the project, you use minus G. And of course, Angular CLI is needed for multiple projects. And after you install it, you will be using a command called ng new. After installing Angular CLI, you will get a new command prompt mm, uh, on command window, ng. So you'll say ng new, a name of the project. And in 30 seconds, maybe it'll take a minute over here because the connection is not super fast, but it'll generate for you a project and we can start it right away without you writing even one line of code. On this slide, you see all these steps. ng new I will be generating the project my store. It'll create a folder my store with files, components, modules, dependencies, and everything in there. I will cd change directory to this newly created one, and then I'll do ng serve. ng is Angular CLI. Serve means build the bundles for me in memory and and prepare the app. By default, it'll be running on port 4200. Minus O means open the browser for me as well. And after you generate the project, you will have one component in there. That component will have uh, the TypeScript file, a file with extension .ts. You see it on the left-hand side. I have a class, app component. In there, I have a property title, initialized with the value app. Also, in the annotation component, we specify the selector, what you can use in angle brackets if you want to use it uh, in HTML as any standard tag. Where is your HTML is? Name of the HTML file. See, clean separation. TypeScript is here, HTML is there. And style sheets, CSS files. Where are they? One or more. Then on the right-hand side, you see a fragment of the generated HTML file. And in there, as you can see, standard HTML tags, and one of them is not standard thing. Welcome to, and double curly braces and title. This is binding. We are binding the value of the property title from your class to the UI. So in this case, it'll say on the screen, welcome to APP. If you will change programmatically or otherwise the value of the title, then it's immediately through binding will be reflected on the UI. And on the local host 4200, you will see this app running. After the app is generated, you can still use, as I said, Angular CLI or NG. You can generate components, services, and so on. NG, G, C. It's a short for NG, generate, component. C for component. NG, G, S, generate, service for me. And again, you're going to be giving names, what to generate module, directive, and so on. So Angular CLA is useful even after you created the first project. Then we need to think about UI. What are you going to be using for UI? Are there any libraries with UI components that you can use? And of course there are. There's maybe like seven, eight, nine libraries that people use. One of the most popular in the front end in JavaScript is Bootstrap. It was created by Twitter. If you want, you can use it. And this is what we're going to be using today while working on our app. We'll be using this Bootstrap 4. At work, I use a different library called Angular Material. It's a library of modern-looking components that come from Angular team, and I highly recommend you to use it. Uh, Flex Layout is for laying out components. It's another library, again, from Angular. If you decide to go with the Angular Material library, which has only like 30 or maybe 32 components for now, and if it's not enough for your app, you can add another one. For example, in one of our app, we use PrimeNG as well. PrimeNG is also a library of components for Angular, which has like 75 components. So you're covered there as well. And this is not the complete list, of course, of the components and libraries. And now we'll start hands-on. So enough talking, let me do something. What I will do, I will generate the app, I will generate components, we will start it, and let's see how it goes. Down there, you see a URL for the link. Slides are there, so I see some people are taking photos. You don't need to take photos, because you will get them in a minute, if you want. 
instructions that I will be using are there as well. So we'll, we'll, uh, I'll show you what's in that file. In, the, in that instructions files, I have sections. They are numbered. So now we will do steps 1.1 to 1.3 from, from the file that is called my store 3 hours HTML. And this is what I will be using. Uh, this is the next slide, but first let, let's, let's do the generation. I already have this file opened. Actually, this is a folder. And that folder shows you what you're going to get in Angular Applied, a folder. Slide over here. It has already uh, an app called My Store. I went through this. So I just wanted I just wanted you to have it if you run into some issues. So I will be generating now another one. I will just give it a different name, but the uh, it'll be sitting here as well. And the file with instruction is here. That's all you need. Again, I assume that you installed, and actually not I assume, the instruction file clearly says that you need to have something installed. And what do you need to have installed? Prerequisites, if you want to run it at home. You need to download and install the current version of Node. Node is a runtime that we will be using. And uh, you need to install Angular CLI. After you do step number one, install uh, Node, then you will get a new command in the command prompt called npm, Node Package Manager. So after that, you can install other packages. So npm install at Angular CLI minus G is what you need to do to, to get the tool, the generator Angular CLI. And as I say, we will develop the little store. The front end will look like this, the, the front page. And when the user click on the title of a product, it'll bring a different page with product details. The data is hard-coded in this version, so you don't need any server. If someone is interested, uh, tomorrow I'm going to be delivering presentation uh, Angular for Java developers. In there, I'm going to be using Spring Boot servers uh, to serve the JSON data, and this same app will be talking to that server. If we have time, maybe I'll have a chance even to demo it over here. All right, so that's the plan. And now the initial project set up. We want to generate, is it big enough? You can see that, guys? Yes? All right. So, ng new my store. That's the initial command that we will do. So I'll go to that folder, assuming that you, uh, that I downloaded it from that uh, uh, GitHub repository I showed you. And what I will do, what I will do, I will run this command. Uh, I am in Angular Applied, ng new uh, my store as per instructions. But I don't want to override that uh, app that I already have, so I'll, I'll call it my store devox. So now, see, all files are already generated. And now what happens is npm installs all dependencies required for this project. In particular, one of the generated files is called package.json. It's over here. As I said, package.json is a list of dependencies that are required for your app. So files are generated. Now npm runs, reads all the dependencies from package.json, and installs them inside that project. What else I will do? I will, while it's installing, I will open up the project. I'm using WebStorm. I, uh, ID from JetBrains. Some people use uh, you know, Visual Studio Code, which is free ID, excellent ID as well. You can use IntelliJ ID if you have it already. So all uh, ID is supported nicely. So what I will do, I will open this project that was generated. It's still installing the dependency, but uh, we, at least we can open up. We can open up the project. B is for Belgium. Applied. Where is that file? My store, my store devox, see that? It was just generated. I'm saying I want to open up this directory. You would do the same thing in IntelliJ ID if you wanted. And what do we have in there? What was generated there? Uh, the SRC folder uh, has some classes and a module that are ready to 
mm, run the app. The packet JSON, where is my packet JSON? It's right there. If you look at it, it has the same thing that I showed you. How come it doesn't, for some reason, it doesn't make it bigger. You probably can still see this. So it has dependency sections up on top. See, we, we are using the version uh, 5.0.0. 5, 5 and down there, it generated a bunch of dev dependencies. For unit testing, library Jasmine, Karma is a test runner. At the bottom, you have uh, TypeScript. All that part is for dev dependencies. The other thing is that the IDE has a terminal. Of course, you know that integrated terminal, so you don't even need to go outside. You can run all the commands that are needed within the IDE. Let me go, uh, actually, I see it already here. Uh, if you go back to the command line, see everything is finished. And when I say finished, I mean that a new directory is created inside your project. This directory is called node modules. It's a standard NPM thing. When you install something, it creates a folder node modules, and in there you have all dependencies listed in packages. One other important file to know about is Angular CLI.json. This file is the one that is for configuring your app. You may need to add some external JavaScript files, maybe libraries. You may uh, need to change where your build files will go and so on. Angular, dot .angular CLI JSON is the place for you to configure. We'll use it for bringing in bootstrap library in here. And, and app directory. That one was generated with a module, which is right there. And a com and app component. App component that they generated consists of several files. App component.ts, TypeScript file. Simple one like I showed you on the slide with title e -E app. Then app component HTML. No, not this one, this one. It's an HTML that was generated. The template for this component, for the app component. Obviously, we, we, what we will do, we will be replacing this template with our code. We will be replacing TypeScript with our code. CSS, it was generated, but it's empty. You can put your CSS styles in there. And it, it, it did generate files that we will not be using during this presentation. It is for unit tests, for Jasmine. Jasmine is a framework that is typically used with Angular apps. We will not be using it over here. So anyway, the app is created, generated. How do we start it? As per instructions, I need to do ng serve dash o means not only build the bundles, but also start the browser, open the browser. Now it's building the bundles. What does it mean? Your app will consist of dozens of or hundred files. You don't you don't want to deploy all these files in your server. You don't want the users to make uh, hundreds of requests to the server. So the files will be bundled together. So your final app will have maybe a dozen files total, not including images, of course. Anyway, the, the bundles were created, and down there you see which are the bundles that were created, and the, the app is running. If I'll go to, if I'll go here to localhost 4200, I'll see that app. The app is up and running. That was a sample app that was generated for me. So what do we, what do we accomplish? We generated a new project with some simple, like, hello world kind of app. The project is fully configured. The project knows how to, how to build using Angular CLI and how to serve. It, it was using the app server that comes with Angular CLI. So that was the first part. Typically how we work. So this app is running. And then I start making changes. All these bundles were built in memory. When I need to go to production, I will run a different command to create files. But for now, everything is built in memory. As soon as I change something in the code, save it, it rebuilds the bundles, and I see a new version within a second or two. So I will kill this app. Why? Because I want to add 
additional libraries from outside of Angular. Otherwise, and after I restart it, I will not kill it again. We will keep making changes and you will see how the UI is changing in front of you. How to kill it, control C. Control C always works. So that part is done. So we created the and started initial app. Now what I want to do, I want to give you a quick intro to TypeScript language. Uh, how many of you even heard about this language two years ago? Anyone? One, two, five people in the room. So probably 5%, I guess. Uh, as of now, as per developer survey on Stack Overflow of this year, it's third most loved language, TypeScript. It is really a good language, was created at Microsoft by Andres Heilsberg, who created also C Sharp, Delphi, what else? Something else. So he knows how to write languages, how to create languages, that's the point. I can tell you the other thing. I don't like JavaScript. And in our company, we did lots of consulting projects in the past seven, eight years using Adobe Flex Framework for the front end. It is a pretty productive uh, framework, but unfortunately it requires Flash Player. And you know what happens with Flash Player. So we started to look for something as a replacement. We tried different frameworks, we tried different, link, different JavaScript frameworks, and what we noticed, the productivity of our developers drops immediately, as soon as they switch to JavaScript. And now, finally, we see this framework with TypeScript, with great support of IDE, with typing, with type ahead help, uh, with the compiler as you type, so the productivity is back. So this is definitely the right choice. So I will just give you a brief overview of TypeScript for 10 minutes. If you want to see a longer version, I recorded a video course. Uh, if you have an account on Safari Books Online from O'Reilly, uh, you can watch it. If you don't, create a, you know, what do they call it, trial version for a couple of weeks, and still you can watch it for free then. So TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. What is a superset in general? It means that if you have a file written in JavaScript, a file with extension .js, if you will just re rename, replace JS into TS for TypeScript, you got the valid TypeScript code without changing one line of code. And you can compile it. And you will tell me, why do I need to compile it if it was initially written in JavaScript? Because JavaScript is not one thing. There is ECMAScript specification, ES5, ES6, ES7, with different syntax, and you may want to write in a newer version of JavaScript and still compile it into older ones so every browser supports it. So, anyway, it's a valid TypeScript, a valid TypeScript file immediately. And it supports typings. You can declare a variable and specify of which type. So Java developers are spoiled with this, but JavaScript don't do this, JavaScript developers. In TypeScript, you can declare variables with types, but it's optional. If you don't want to, don't declare. If you want to take an existing app and declare some of the types, go ahead and do it. So they don't force you to declare types, but obviously it is suggested and recommended. It supports types, classes, interfaces, generics, annotations, all the things that you know from Java. In general, for Java developers, it's very easy language to learn. If you'll go to typescriptlang.org, there is a menu item called Play. This is a playground. You can try something in TypeScript on the left-hand side of the screen, and it'll automatically compile you Compile this code into JavaScript, and you'll see immediately the result on the right. So in this example, you see on the left, there is a class person with a constructor with some variables, and it's automatically compiled into ECMAScript 5 syntax. Basically, that the JavaScript that everybody is using these days, every browser supports, it turns it into a function. If I would... If I was sure that my users have browsers that support newer versions of JavaScript, ES6, for example, 
then I could specify a target for compilation ES6, and then the code on the right would look different. It would use classes and other features from JavaScript. Inheritance. I have a class person on the left in TypeScript, right, with a constructor, and on line number nine, I have class employee that extends person, very similar to what you do in Java. Uh, the difference here, though, is line number three. In Java, a constructor has the same name as a class, but in here, you just need to use this keyword constructor. JavaScript, if you know or maybe you don't, doesn't support classical inheritance. It supports so-called prototypal inheritance, and you can see on the right-hand side a whole bunch of code that, was, that would be equivalent of the TypeScript version on the left. The nature of inheritance doesn't change, so the compiled code still will use prototypal inheritance in JavaScript, but writing syntax is a lot easier, of course. And, by the way, ECMAScript 6, which is supported, by the way, by 95% of the browsers these days, also have these uh, classes, no, no interfaces at all. Generics, S similar, not exactly the same, but similar to Java generics. As you can see over here, angle bracket person. Let's see, I have a class person with a property name, I have a class employee with a property department, employee extends person, and I have a class animal. Then I declare an array of workers in line 13, and I use generic notation saying that I only allow to put person or its descendants in there, like in Java. And then I do workers zero, new person, workers one, new employee, workers two, new animal. And immediately I get the compile time error. It shows you on this side, it shows you on your, in your IDE. So why? Because it says, you said that you're gonna be placing there uh, objects of type person or, it, or employee for example. How come you put in there animal? When I looked at it, knowing Java, and I, I, I said to myself, oh, I already understand generics. Not exactly. There are some specifics. Uh, they are not exactly the same. I don't want to go into detail. If you will watch that course, you will see why. But overall, you can think of it like, like Java generics. Parameterized types. Interfaces. Interfaces in TypeScript are used for two reasons. One of them, to declare a type. For example, if you would need to declare some value object, a class with uh, certain properties. In, instead of declaring a class, you can declare an interface. Like in this case, I create interface I person with several properties. And line number six, I'll take a look. SSN, social security number. Uh, this is an ID that every person in the United States has. I put a question mark in there, which means optional, which means you are allowed to create instances of object that will not have this property. So line number nine, I have a class person with constructor, and it, it expects the parameter of type I person. And then in line number 15 and below, I create a new instance of the object. Again, I declare a variable A person, of type I person, and I initialize it. This is object literal notation from the JavaScript, these curly braces. Then I create in line number 21, I create new person, and uh, then I can print it. Uh, please uh, take a look. I did not specify social security number. Why? Because it was marked as um, optional, and that's why I don't have an error. What is interesting? On the right-hand side, if you look at the generated version of JavaScript, you don't see any mentioning of interfaces. Why? Because JavaScript doesn't support interfaces. So they will not even be compiled. They are useful for you as a developer to help you if you make mistakes in terms of code, um, of types, but in the resulting code, it's not there. Implements, similar to Java. You can, use an, you can declare an, in, an interface, and you can say that your class implements an interface. Up on top, I, I declared an interface I payable with one method, increase pay. And let's say we have two types of workers in our company, employees who, um, uh, who get paid by salary and contractors who get paid hourly. So, and we want to write, create a, an interface with increased pay so we can 
uh, increase pay for all workers in our company. So is, I declared an interface, and then I say in line number six, class employee implements I payable, and I write one implementation of increased pay, whatever is uh, applicable to employees. Line number 13, I create another class that implements I payable, and for that class I uh, write different implementation of increased pay for contractors. And then in line number 20, I create an array of workers of type I payable. In the first element, I put new instance of employee. In the second, new instance of the contractor. And then in line number 24, I run for each loop and I invoke increase pay on every object from there. And it'll be properly resolved. So very similar to what you do in Java. How do you compile uh, the code written in TypeScript? If you'd be just using TypeScript without Angular help, then you would be using TypeScript compiler, TSC. You need to install it using npm, npm install TypeScript global, and then you'll have a new command on your command prompt, TSC. Like in this line, last line of the slide, what do I do? I say TSC dash dash T, meaning target, into which target syntax you want to compile your code. In this case, I say into ECMAScript 5 because it's, it's supported by each and every browser. What do you want to compile? I want to compile file main.ts. That's a, for one example. The better choice would be to create a file with uh, options for the compiler, a separate file, like in tsconfig.json, that's the name. Uh, there's like probably three dozens of different options that you can specify for the compiler. And instead of typing them on the long line, you just put them there. Like in this case, I specify the output directory will be dist, meaning compile all my classes into this directory. So I don't have a mix between TypeScript and JavaScript classes. How to find, cl uh, how to find modules in your code, in what resolution to use is node, meaning try to find a local directory. If not found, find it in node modules and some other options that are needed for Angular specifically. And target over here, by the way, I said ECMAScript 5. So if you have, if you run the TSC command from the directory which has this file, you don't even need to specify any parameters. You just enter TSC, it will read the options and it will do the job. In this case, it would produce the output in the folder dist. Do you have any questions so far, guys? Anyone? No questions, all right. So data binding, uh, brief overview. Data binding is about keeping data and UI in sync. Something changes in the data, in the properties of your classes, immediately we see the changes in the, on the UI. Or all the way around, you, if the user is typing something in the field, we want to sync it up with the data on the uh, property of the UI. The user clicked on the button, we want to invoke a method in your class. This is also done using binding. In Angular, it is implemented using unidirectional binding. Uh, let's look at some examples. For example, if I have a look at this line, h1, it's an HTML, right? Header 1. Hello, and something in the double curly braces. It means apparently there is a class with a property name, so whatever is in that property will be uh, used in, in the template. So it'll evaluate the expression, or in this case, just the variable name, and it'll replace these curly braces with the value. Or the other example, span. Standard HTML element span, and it has a property hidden. Square brackets, when you see square brackets on the left-hand side of the equal sign, it's also binding, binding to properties. So we are saying, we want to bind the value of is zip code valid, the postal code, to the property hidden. Again, by looking at this line, I, I understand that apparently there is a class in this component which has a property is zip code valid of type boolean. So if it's true, hidden property becomes true, so the user will not see the message zip code is not valid. If zip, if zip code uh, valid becomes false, hidden is false, the user will see this text about the error. Now, that, that the previous slide was about binding from properties to UI. 
On this slide, I show you some examples on binding from the UI to the members of the class. The first line, I have a button HTML object, and I want to handle click event on the button. Handling event in Angular is just placing it in, in parentheses. So when the user clicked on the button, I see that uh, the method place bid will be invoked. Once again, it's, it's a method written somewhere in my class. Or input field, again, it's an HTML, it's HTML component, and I want to handle input event, and I invoke another method. Or, if you want, you can create your own custom component or components, and you can fire custom events if need be. In this example, I look at this tag and I can guess that apparently somebody created a component which is price quarter component, there's a property selector. They put that name in there, pr um, price quarter. And by looking at this line, I understand that apparently that component may trigger event called, called last price, custom event. And what do we want to do here? Whenever this event is triggered, we want to invoke a method price quote handler. So that's the example of unidirectional binding. But in this case, it's from UI to the property. Dependency injection. Uh, Angular framework creates instances for you. You understand the benefits of dependency injections in general. Uh, in particular, it, you don't need to worry about writing all these new, new, new statements to create instances, and it becomes very easy to switch. For example, you work with, with one service that is injected into your component, let's say with a mock product service. The real server is not ready yet, so you, you don't have the, the real data, so you can create a class mock product service, and it'll be injected in, in your component, so you can keep working and see uh, the result. At some point, the uh, actual product service will be ready, that will be talking to the server, so changing one line, you can switch what will be injected. So in every place in your app that was using product service, it'll start using uh, the, the instance of product service, as opposed to mock product service. In Angular, how do you specify what to instantiate? The simplest scenario would be to say, I have a class product service, and uh, whenever I want you to inject this uh, instance for me, just use this class. But not always it's as simple as that. Sometimes you may want to create a factory function. That factory function can specify which object to create depending on some conditions, right? In some cases, you may want to, to specify the value to inject, not even an object, but a value. So there are different ways of specifying what you want to instantiate. The, and they have a concept of providers. Providers specify what to instantiate. In this class, they say, sorry, in this slide, I, I say, Whenever you see product service, they have a concept of token. Create actually an instance of class product service. Or the short notation would be when the token and the class name are the same, you can just say providers product service. But if you decide to switch from product service to mock product service, you would change a provider. In multiple places, the constructors of classes will have product service token. Don't touch it. You don't need to change anything in there. The fact that you change the provider will automatically start injecting different objects into your classes. And how, where is the injection point? It's a constructor of the class. You have a class with, with, with constructor, like this middle bullet on the slide, and if you'll say product service of, it looks like of type product service, but again it's a token, Angular will automatically uh, see, do I have a provider? Do I know how am I supposed to instantiate it? It'll try to find the provider line, and it'll see, oh, they want me to just create an instance of product service. 
Angular will do it and it'll eject it into your constructor. After that, you can start using it. No need to create, to use the new, um, the new keyword. The provider, you can declare it either on the components class or up on top in the modules class. If you will declare a provider on the module level, then you technically saying to Angular, create for me a singleton. I need an instance of the service that every component will reuse it. If you want to, to create an instance of the service specific to this particular component and its children, specify this provider's line on the component level. Pretty simple syntax for that. And, and what we will do, actually I'll finish this slide and then I'll start doing things. So in this case, I show you a command ng gs product so, uh, minus m app modules. What does it mean? ng, it's a Angular CLI, g means generate, s means service. What do you want to call it? Product. It will be the name of the class. Angular automatically will create a class product with capital P, service with capital S. Minus m means and add provider line to the module definition. It, it, you don't have to do it uh, in the command, you can do it manually, but still. So it'll generate for you a class that looks like this on the right hand side. And in the module, it'll add this product service to the list of providers. If you want to change it later, go ahead and do this. And this is a sample injectable service. For example, class product service. By the way, I use the keyword export. Why? It's a rule, it's from ECMAScript 6 spec. If you have a file, you declare in there some class, and if you want to use that class elsewhere in another file, you need to use a keyword export. Otherwise, that other file will say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see it. So if you want something to be visible outside, you use an export statement, and accordingly, in the other place, you can use import statement to import things from scripts. In this case, I, dec I declare a class product service with one method, get products, which returns a type product. It's like a value object. I declared it as an interface with so, with so many fields. And I hard coded an instance of a new product. In a real world situation, you would be making an HTTP request here to get data. But for simplicity, for simplicity I just hard coded it here. And how do you inject that service? Now we, we'll, we see a component. Once again, component is a class with UI, with et component annotation. Let's start reading from bottom up. I have a class product component with a property product and with constructor. Look at the constructor's argument, product uh, service. When Angular sees it, it understands that I want injection. So that service that you saw on the previous slide will be instance of that service will be created and injected into this constructor. And right after, I can, I can invoke its API, get product. So in this case, I invoke get product. The result will be placed in the product variable. And now let's move up. The template, the UI that the user will see. What do we see here? Product details title and binding. I want to bind product.title in this line. In the next line, I want to bind product.description and in the third line, I want to bind product.price. In this case, I also attach the dollar sign even though it could be done differently. In this example, I'm using providers on the component level. So, uh, so it, from this code, you, you don't know if on the module level I have another one, maybe provider, maybe not, but at least provider must be declared somewhere. In some cases, you may have dependencies of dependencies. And in my example, if it would be a real world product service, I would have product service and it would need a special object from Angular called HTTP client. HTTP client is an object that knows how to make any HTTP request. Put, get, post, delete, all that. So I would inject HTTP client instance into my product service, and product service 
into my product component. So this is how it typically works. Services are for working with data. How do you get data? You, you use Angular's HTTP client instance. And here's an example of how you could do something like this. If you are planning to use HTTP, you need to import it in your module, and you need to add the HTTP module into the import sections, section of your ng module decorator. You're saying, I am planning to work with uh, HTTP. Then, in the product service on the right, for example, you would say, inject over here HTTP client. I need it. And then you start using it immediately. This.http.get product.json in this case. Or you can specify any REST endpoint on your Java server or any other web server in here. So you're going to get data back. So this is, this is where we injected HTTP client into the service, product service. And then on the left, we inject product service into product component. So it's a typical situation, HTTP client into a service, service into component. And then binding to show something on the UI. And now let's, let's do that. So what we will do now, we will continue working as per instructions. I will generate a bunch of components for our store and the service. And let's see if it works. It will. And where is my instructions? Um, it's over here. All right. So, so what did we do so far? We cre we generated a new new project, which we and we d did uh, ng serve to bring it up. You saw that uh, hello world type of project with big Angular logo in there. We did Control C. We killed it. Why? Because we want to add additional library. As I said, I'm going to be using Bootstrap, that popular library with my TypeScript. And this is, by the way, an example of how could you use one of the popular thousands of popular JavaScript libraries. You can use third-party libraries with your TypeScript project. So in this case, what I want to do, I want to install no, uh, Bootstrap. Bootstrap next means install for me version 4 of Bootstrap. It's still in beta, that's why they want it to be with next. Uh, Bootstrap has dependency on two other things, jQuery and special library called Popper. So now it's installed these libraries, and so installation is done, as you can see. And did I specify? Mm. Yes, I specify that. So what's next? When you will be reading documentation for Bootstrap, for, you don't even think about Angular at all. You just decided to learn Bootstrap. They will tell you. You have to include into your app this particular CSS, and you have to include in your app these particular scripts. If this wouldn't be an Angular app generated by CLI, you would be just opening HTML, and you would be adding script section and uh, CSS in there. But with Angular CLI projects, it's a bit different. What you do is, remember I said there is one configuration file, .angularcli.json. In there, there is a section called styles. So if you read documentation about any libraries and they say you need styles to be global for the app, you just add it to the style section. Just because I just installed Bootstrap, it installed in my node modules directory, Bootstrap folder, and in particular, it has that CSS. So what I will do, I will take this piece styles. I will go to dot angular CLI uh, dot JSON. It has its own style generated section, which has uh, just one file. What I will do, I will replace this section with the one from instructions. So I added bootstrap CSS as global. Now it has also section scripts and again documentation for the bootstrap says that it has to be, it has to include jQuery, JavaScript, Popper, and Bootstrap. All right, so I copy paste and I replace the empty uh, property scripts with this one. So 
So that part is done. That's pretty much it. it. So I added Bootstrap to my project now. So what I can do now, I will just, re I can restart. I can restart my project and G-Serve. Dash O. Nothing will change because, because I didn't use anything yet. I didn't change anything in the UI, but the very fact that it'll start successfully with additional dependency would tell me that I added Bootstrap properly. Yes, the app is running. Okay, let's move on uh, and do what's required. What is required next? We want to work on that My Store app, which will have app component, which was generated for us already. We will change it, but we have the top level component. Underneath, we, have, we want to have a nav bar. On the left, we will have the advanced search. At the bottom, we want to have a footer component. And in the main area of the screen, we want to display either home component or product detail component. It will be uh, driven by the router. So we need to generate a bunch of components. And how to do this? Using Angular CLI, I will open another terminal window. I, I want to leave that service running alone. I will open up another terminal window, and I will be running all these commands. And GGC, C is component. Generate for me home component, footer, navbar, product, item, product, detail, and search. This option minus spec false means don't generate for me file for unit testing. I just specify it. We are not going to be doing unit testing anyway in this session, so we don't want it. So this uh, copy-paste each command one after the other. By the way, first of all, I want to open up the second terminal window. And I do this. First command. Done. It created for me three files. TypeScript, HTML, CSS, and it updates the, uh, the app module. So uh, let me click to refresh. As you can see, see this folder home? It was generated just a second ago with all these files. We will replace the boilerplate code, of course. And if you will open up the module, look at this. This home component, it, it added just now because I generated. The last line, if you can read it, updated, it updated the module. All right, so what else we want to do? Footer, navbar, product, and so on. Let me, let me generate all of them. So the next one will be footer component. The next one will be navbar. I decided to call them like this. It's not something that's required. Navbar. What else I need? Search component. It's all in the instruction. Search. And I need two more. Product item and product detail. Product detail is the second screen that will be shown if the user will click on the product title. Uh, product item. This component represents one product. If you remember on the landing page of the app, you saw a bunch of uh, rectangles. Each rectangle is one product. So is it? Is this it? Product item? I didn't do product detail, I guess. Product detail. And this will be the last component. And we will need uh, a we will need a service, a service with the data. All right, so components are ready. If I click over here, look at this, the module part in the declaration section. All of these guys that I just generated are already listed there, and the import statement were added um, accordingly. Now, we want to generate a service which has some data, hard-coded data, but it's still data. So what do we want to do for that? And G, G, S, S is for service. I can do it. Of course, I remember that, but I want you to see that I am not cheating and I go by the manual. I want to make sure that if you want, you can do it at home. So I want to generate a service product. But if you see that some of the services will be reused in multiple places, it makes sense to generate it in a folder called shared. 
so multiple components can reuse. So copy paste control C control V. It doesn't work. It does. Again, I say generate for me a service and minus me app module. I'm saying take a look, it's still an old older version of uh, module up on top, line twenty five, providers is empty. Now I'll refresh it. And see there, it added product service in there. So I generated a service in the shared folder. Just boilerplate, I mean, we will replace it anyway. But at least I have it, so all these pieces fit together. So what I just did, I generated a bunch of components and one service. What else is missing? I will need another class uh, and a router. I am planning to use a router. What for? I am planning to use router to make sure that when the in, but that initially in the area called router outlet, the app will render home component. And when the user will click on the title, that router outlet area will be replaced with product detail component. So for that, I need to configure routes. Look at this example. Router module for root, for root means for root component. We specify mapping. We, sp we say whenever the URL in the address bar has nothing after the base URL, like localhost 4200, by default, render home component. But if the URL has a fragment, product slash and some value, let's say product was AD1 or 2 or 3, then render product detail component. Render where? In that area called router outlet. That's the router configuration. So what I will do, I will take this little piece, router module for root, and I will copy it over into my module. And I will need to remember to do the import. As a matter of fact, uh, the ID may help you with this as well. So I go, going back to router module, I'm saying I am planning to use to use the router. That's why in the import section I add that thing. Alt enter and the ID automatically added the line. As you can see, it I don't see, it's underlined line number twelve. It's in red. If you will scroll, if you will hover the mouse over, it's not a compiler error, it's a linter error. The project also has a bunch of rules. In that, in that particular case, it complained that uh, it, it is using uh, double quotes, but it has to use single quotes. I have a choice. Either I will disable TSLint so it will not bother us, or I will fix this. It's not an error, it's just about the styles. You can specify the rules about the styles. Let me change it to to single. So the redness is gone. So I added the router. By the way, on the other console over here, there is something. Where did it find view encapsulation? Hmm? Cannot find view encapsulation. In now bar component. Let me double check. Now bar component. How it ended up here, I don't know. We don't need it. See, it's it's a bug actually in CLI. It's the first time I see that. It, this file I didn't write. I generated it in front of you. It is using encapsulation property. I can import it, of course, alt enter, but it shouldn't even be giving me this error. I so they are fixed now, but it shouldn't be doing it. Let me do control C and do clean rebuild. And uh, NGSurf. Let me see if it will build the bundles or it will give me some errors again. No, now it builds. No, it doesn't. So 
view encapsulation in invariant home. See, this tool generate, generated this view encapsulation. I didn't want. I didn't want. I don't want to talk about view encapsulation, but I'll tell since we ran into it, so you understand what's going on. The thing is that there is something called web component specification. It's not specific to Angular, and one of the parts of that. Uh, specification is about encapsulation of styles within the components. As you know, on the front end, um, in the browser, there is an object called DOM, document object model. It's uh, sitting behind the UI and it's like a tree structure. So if you apply styles to different nodes of this uh, object, um, styles may interleave. And there is something like encapsulation of styles and in the web component spec, they have something called Shadow Dome. I don't know if you've heard about it, but basically a browser can put a wall, a protection, so the styles will not mix up of this component with the rest. So Angular offers you, Angular offers you this um, support of uh, encapsulation, but, um, but uh, as I say, CLI generated these uh, lines, but it forgot to generate import statement for us. As a matter of fact, I don't even need to fix that because I will be still replacing this boilerplate anyway of these components, but I'm just telling you. So there are two cases. Either remove this line with view encapsulation or do, um, or do an import. Let me leave it alone. I will replace this code anyway. But, but, but what is important to note, I want you to, to see, if there is something out of ordinary, I'm expecting to see an app here, but I see something else. What do I do? I open up Chrome, uh, Chrome Developers Tools, and in the console, I see it, it tells me what's wrong. So if you don't see something that you expect in the browser, go to Menu, View, Developer, Developer Tools, and you will see the panel with the sources. You can debug in there. You can see the network traffic, of course, and you can see the errors as well. So I'll leave it alone again because I will be replacing this boilerplate uh, code anyway. So what I just did, what did we accomplish so far? Um, from our instructions, we generated component we generated one service and we configured routes. Only two routes are here. Typically in a real world app, you would be starting with asking yourself, what kind of navigation do I need to specify for my, uh, for my app? You may have multiple routes, in routes can be sub routes and so on. It's a pretty big uh, component router. Uh, I, I can talk about it for two hours, just about the router. Pretty powerful thing. And it always keeps in sync the URL, the fragments of the URL, and the component, the corresponding component. All right, so this is, this is what we just did. And now, let's start slowly, let's start slowly uh, replacing the code, the generated code with the real one. First of all, the app component. The app component, in our case, it has TypeScript, and it has HTML, and it has CSS files, three separate files. This is what I want to be, this is what I want to have in the HTML file of my app. My app component is a top-level component, and let's see what do we read here. It looks like a bunch of HTML tags, but not all of them are standard tags. Look at, look at the top one, app nav bar. Where is it coming from, guys? What is that, app nav bar? Anyone? The component that I generated, exactly. When I generate a component, it has a property. Let me go to nav bar, nav bar component. It has a property, every component has a property, a selector. Whatever word you put in there, you can use it as a tag elsewhere in HTML. So that's the thing. You know what, let me, 
Let me fix these bugs. It's annoying. Uh, it's not a not my bug, but let me fix it anyway. Anywhere else? And now it complains about which one? Product, uh, yeah. In every component, it added this line. It shouldn't be there. Save a uh, product item. And where else? Search. Footer, footer, it says footer. Search and footer, right. Search. And footer. It's right there. If anyone has questions, please let me know. I'll try to answer. Or everything is crystal clear. No, something else. What else? Nav bar. Now let me try to control C and restart it to see cleaner error report. It's a very good question. Are there some tools to migrate from older Angular to the newer one? Uh, theoretically, yes. If you will read Google's documentation, they suggest something called NG upgrade. It's not a tool, it's a path, it's a methodology. They say what to do. And they say initially you would run two versions of the framework within the same app. And gradually you would be replacing pieces from the old version with the new one. So if you search for NG upgrade, there is one. Ideally, if you can, rewrite it from scratch, if it's not a huge app. It's not always the case, sometimes you cannot do this. Why? Because you may have an app running in production, and you, you still have to maintain the app. You have clients. You cannot just say stop and come back in three months. So you have to. So in that case, you would need to gradually replace uh, pieces of your app, route by route, but you, for some time you'll be running two versions in parallel on the client. So we still have errors. These errors are where? These are errors are in their code. Where did you put the import of the working model? Where did I put what? App module. App module has all these. It's right there. Router module. I I imported it over here and I added the I added the route configuration over there. Okay, let's do let's do one thing before the break and during the break I will clean up this uh, the rest. What else I mm, I wanted to show you in this code. We will be replacing components by comp after components. So in this case, you see that app nav bar at the top. At the bottom, I see app footer. This will be my footer component. In the middle, I have a div with container. And this class row, whenever you see CSS over here, this CSS is uh, from supported by Bootstrap library. In particular, Bootstrap Library has something called Flexible Grid System. Any UI that you have, you can think of it that as if it has 12 invisible columns. And the whole idea is they want to give you something that, is, that allows you to create apps that works on different screens, different sizes. And you can specify, again, having in mind this fact that any screen has 12 columns, you can say that in large screen, I want to give three out of 12 columns to the left nav bar, for example, and nine to the rest. So uh, for smaller screens, you can specify, no, I don't want to give three and nine. I want to allocate them one under the other. So you can read about the grid system. I think I have a link over there, but I just want to explain you. 
when you see this screen and you see something like this, call MD3 and call MD9. See, 9 plus, plus 3 is total 12. What I'm saying is, assuming that you have 12 columns, I want to give three of these columns to what? To the search component. And the rest, I want to give it to the area router outlet. So by looking at, it, at this, I can guess that search component will be always on the screen, taking 25% of the real estate in terms of whip on the viewport. And on the right-hand side will be my router outlet. Router outlet can, will show either the home component or the product detail component. So one by one, what you will be doing, you will be replacing. Like in this case, I, uh, I write in this manual, take app component HTML and replace its content. What, what do we have in there for now? We have something that was generated for us by uh, Angular CLI. We don't need it. I replaced it. Now I will take the, the next part would be, um, the next part would be, um, the next part would be to, um, uh, to see this screen, to see it works. I have a couple of errors that I will fix, but now it's a good time to take a break. Let's take 15 minute break. And after the break, we will continue from this point on. Let's continue. So, as I expected, when I was quickly replacing this uh, broken, uh, uh, broken view encapsulation, uh, in one place I put the wrong import, that's why it gave me errors. And also I wanted to, uh, to say there are two gentlemen in the audience who came over and pointed me that I put the wrong import, so these guys will get uh, the discount to get the book for free. So if you will stop by after, I will give you the code. So anyway, so what we have now, since the error was fixed in that view encapsulation, this import statement was incorrect. We have the app that looks like this. Navbar, work, search, works, footer, works, and so on. This is all generated. This is not written by me. When I was generating components, it would generate HTML in each, in each of these that says footer works, or over here, home component works. So we will replace these fake HTML with ours, so gradually we'll see how the app works. But even now, you can see that up on top, there is a place for the navigation bar, at the bottom for the footer, on the left for the search component, and on the right, by default, for the home component. So I'll keep it running and let's and we'll move on with the code changes. So what what did I do right before the break? Before the break I added to the app component, no to the app component HTML, this little piece. But I don't mm, but the navbar is not ready yet. That's why it says navbar works instead of showing some nice navbar. So now when we will replace the content of HTML for the navbar component, you will see it on the screen. And if you'll go uh, by instructions, I should have it somewhere there. So right now we are at this point and we see the screen as expected. Now let's take care of the navbar component. Navbar component, in this case, I just copy-pasted a navbar, standard navbar that comes with Bootstrap. If you will follow this link, uh, you will find the ready-to-go Bootstrap. So they suggest you take it and then replace with the menu items whatever you need. So I just uh, copy-pasted it from, uh, from that link, from that link, and I will take this code. Obviously, it's not the enough bar that I want to see in my uh, little store, but at least you will see that it works. So what I will do now, I will replace the navbar component HTML, its content that was generated for me, 
was this one. Save. I don't know if you noticed, as soon as I saved at the bottom, you see how it recompiles, recompiles and rebuilds the bundles. So if, if I will go back to the browser, where am I am running my store devox, as you can see up on top, I have a toolbar. Yes, this toolbar is not a real one, but at least it's a good place to start. I will not touch it, but as you can see, we added it. Next. Let's move on by instructions. We did this part. The next part is, yes, I show you that we see this nav bar. It, it has, it supports themes. Right now I was using light, uh, light background for the nav bar, but you can change it easily by making a really small, mm, really small change. For example, uh, this is from uh, Bootstrap. So light bar, if I would you change this to blue or red. Actually, there are different uh, words for this, for the theme. You would see different colors. Next, let's, let's uh, copy-paste the code for the search component. In this case, once again, I don't have time to, um, to explain um, the Forms API. I'll just tell you a big picture. Angular offers you really good support for forms. And most of the enterprise apps require works for forms, with forms. Angular offers you two APIs. One is so-called template-driven API, and the other one is called reactive API. In this example, I use template-driven API. What does it mean? It means that you don't need to write code in TypeScript. The entire form with additional features offered by Angular is done in template. In this example, once again, I'm not going to go through the details, but as you probably know, any form on the UI should have some model behind it, some object with properties. So the user fill out the form, and the properties are changed accordingly. So this ng form is a directive from Angular if you use template-driven form. Uh, what else? Mm. You give names for the model. Angular, if you use this API, Angular will automatically create for you the model object behind the scene that will hold all the value from the form. How, uh, how, do you, how can you access them? By giving names to each field. See, I say name title, name price over here, uh, uh, name category, and Behind the scenes, Angular will create an object with these properties corresponding to the UI. So anyway, so I will just copy paste it. If you want to have more advanced work with forms, uh, and typically what you use, you use second API. Second API is called reactive API. You have to write a bit more code. You have to create a model for the form on your own. You will create a new instance of the class but it gives you a lot more flexibility. You can create uh, and dynamically assign custom validators. As a matter of fact, you can create them over here as well, but it's a bit more uh, coding. You can create dynamic forms. Say, for example, you have a form uh, with a field, enter your email. What if the user has more than one email to enter. So you want dynamically keep adding components to the form. Reactive Forms API has these features. So pretty powerful. But in this example, again, I am using template-driven API, so I don't need to write any code in the, in the TypeScript. So I'll just take this HTML and copy-paste it into mm, search component HTML. In this field, in this form, I have the title field, so the user could enter the title and find the product by the title. I have what I have, uh, price and category. We will not be implementing this form, but at least it will look nice. Uh, search component, where is that search component? Right there. So search component HTML. No, this is a TypeScript. Right now it has generated code, but now I put it, put this and once again, the bundles are already rebuilt in memory. 
if I will go back and see how my app looks now and you see it doesn't look anyhow so what does it tell us? it tells us there are some errors so I need to open up the console and see what errors are there and the errors are there status 404 it cannot find, it doesn't understand what is ng form because ng form is not something that HTML knows why? because I, I didn't forget, I even put it in the instructions that you will see 404 but if you remember in the beginning I said in the module if you need to work with forms add form module, if you need to work with HTML add HTTP module, so I did not add form support in the module. That's why it complains, it tells me 404. And if you will read instructions, I believe I described it over here. Yep. The browser stopped rendering the app, right? It doesn't know what is ng form. So we need to add it to the module. We want to say, yes, I am planning to use forms in my module. So add it to the import uh, section in the at ng module decorator. Let's, let's go and find our module file. See, for now I have only the browser module and the router module. Now I will add one more, the forms module. Once again, you, you, don't, you need to import it. See, it doesn't know what it is. Alt enter or write it down manually. These threads are not uh, because I make mistakes, but it's because TSLint. By the way, if you want to turn it off, file, uh, preferences, uh, languages, framework, uh, TypeScript, and somewhere down there, if you'll open it up, and it doesn't open up for some reason, which I don't know why. Oh, it's right there. See, TSLint, it is enabled. I will disable it so it will not bother me. But uh, it's not a good idea to disable. Uh, this project was generated with a bunch of rules that identify a nice style. You can add the style based on the rules or preferences in your organization, and TSLint will help you, will help every developer to make sure that they write the proper code. Okay, so let me go back and see how my app looks now. Yeah, it looks not, it's now it looks much better. See, now I have nav bar on top, and on the left I have my form. So far, no home components. It still says home works, and at the bottom you can still see footer works. All right, getting there. Moving on. This is exactly what we see. Footer component is very simple. You typically, you put copyrights, terms and conditions, something like this in there. So I will copy-paste this little code, and I will put it in the component HTML. And once again, take a look. I div class call LG12. It says uh, take uh, all 12 columns on the large displays. So where is my footer? Mm, footer component, it's up on top. Footer component HTML. It says now footer works, we will replace it, save it, recompiled, right? And we'll go back and let's take a look. We see footer, right? Footer component, it says copyright my store 2017. That part is done. Let's move on. Product service. Now we need some data. We need some data. First of all, I have a service with hard-coded data. Look at this. I have a whole bunch of JSON hard-coded in the class product service. And I defined two methods in there. Get products, if I want to retrieve all the products for my home page. Or, and I have another method called get product by ID. If ID will be given to this service, it will return only one product. When do I need that one? When the user will click on one of the titles in the product on the home page of the products. I will pick that ID and will pass it over to product detail. And I will invoke the method on the service called get product by ID. 
technically, this is a place get product by ID or get products where I would be making HTTP requests in a real world app. But over here, for simplicity, I just created a, uh, an array product and I return it right from there. Like in this example, see, I return product. Product is an array with hard coded data. It's JSON. In case of get product by ID, what do I do? I do find inside the array, I try to find the product that has the ID, whatever was given to me as an argument. And what do I return? In, in the method get product, I return an array of type products, product, and get product by ID returns just one. So I need a value object, right, of type product. I need to describe it. So that's why before taking care of the product service, I want to create a type. I will create a, a file, product.ts, where I will define the product type, which will be returned by the functions. So how to do that? Um, I want to create it also in the shared folder where my, where my product service is. Right-click, uh, right new, TypeScript file, I'll call it product, and I will paste this code. I declared it as an interface. I could declare it as a, type, as a class as well. But the thing is that JavaScript doesn't support interfaces anyway. So if I declared it as an interface during the compilation of the code, JavaScript will have no even no mentioning of this guy. And if I have multiple uh, classes like this just to define a value object, it makes sense to declare it, them as an interfaces. You will still get help from your IDE if you make mistakes, if you pass the wrong properties or so, or wrong types, but the resulting code will be smaller because these, this piece or, or similar pieces will not be even compiled. It wouldn't be a mistake if I would replace interface with class over here, but again, I would have more code generated in the JavaScript side. So I keep it there. Now product service, we need to replace this empty one which was generated for me with the code that I just showed you. I will take the whole thing. the whole thing and I will copy paste it into the product service instead of that. By the way, I want to mention one other thing. When you have a class uh, that needs to be injected, typically we mark it with the annotation at injectable. It's needed for Angular, you know, for generating some metadata. There are certain things when you may mm, mm, skip it, but General rule, just put it there. So we have service and we have product, right? Let's go back. Let's see, is there any difference in the app itself? Not just yet, not just yet. It says home works. The question is, who is using our service? What we are planning to do, we are planning to have a home component and in there we'll have a bunch of these uh, rectangular pieces. Each of them is product item components. So what we will do now, we will make sure that home component invokes the product service, retrieves all products, and then we'll give each and every product to product item component for rendering. So far we didn't do it yet. So let's, let's take care of the home component. Then. I believe this will be the next step. No, product item component, sorry. Home component will get the data and will be passing them to the product item component. Now I want to say about communication between components. There are multiple ways of communication between components. If, you have, if your app is a tree of components, the question is how a component A can pass the data to component B. There are different ways to do that and, and the nice way mm, is to create loosely coupled components. So component A doesn't know about component B, 
but still they can send data back and forth. There are different ways of doing this. Uh, you, you can implement the mediator design pattern, and I believe I have a couple of slides on that. And as a matter of fact, 1.7, step 1.7 should be done after I will give you just a little bit of theory. So let's go back to slides. And before dealing with product item component, we'll talk a little bit about intercomponent communication. First of all, you can think of any component in Angular as a black box. Imagine that this black box has some entry doors or input properties. Through, through these entry doors, this component can receive data from its parent. In our case, home component will be passing data to product item component. In some cases, a component needs to send data out. Let's say I have a component that connects to a server to get stock prices. The component gets stock prices, but that's the only thing that it can do. So what it can do, what else it can do? It can send this data as an event through output properties. So output properties, like again, black box, output doors. Through these output doors, the component will be sending data to the parent. And these are two annotations that we can use with component at input. If you think that a component has a property that, and the value will be given from the parent, mark it with annotation at input. If you want a component to send data out, create a property, mark it with at output, and use a special class called event emitter. The component sends data out by emitting events. Events can carry a payload. For example, I can receive a, a price quote about the stock, and I can send an event, last price, for example, custom event, and inside of that event, I can put the actual data, the symbol of the stock, the price of the stock, and so on. And this code shows you an example of how a parent can bind data to the child's input properties. In this case, it's an app component. Let's read the code and try to guess what do we see. What do I see? I see that it's an app component. It has a property a stock of type string, and it has some uh, method on input event. Let's read the HTML and try to guess again what's in there. What do I see in HTML in the template property? I have an input field where the user can enter the symbol of a stock. Say I want to get a price for Apple. And I, whenever a change event happens, when change event happens, when I move the focus out of the field, say I enter IBM, tab out, or click somewhere else, and change event happens. Change event happens, and I invoke the method on input event, passing the standard DOM event from the browser. On input event, get this event and uh, assign it to the property stock. The property stock will have a value. Say I enter IBM. So what happens with this property? Look at this. I use this property in other components. Angle bracket order processor. I can guess, once again, that apparently there is a component called order processor. And by looking at these uh, properties in square brackets, once again, square, square brackets on the left side of the equal sign means binding. We are binding data to these properties. By looking at this line, I can guess that order processor has stock symbol property marked as at input. And it has quantity property marked as at input. So I'm binding the value of stock, whatever user entered, so it'll jump right inside of the child component. And I bind 100 in this case, say I want to buy always 100 shares of, of the stock, to the property quantity. Now the child, how the child will receive the data from the parent. This one is an order processor that, you saw, that was used in the previous slide. And let's look at it. 
Class order component, it has a property quantity marked as at input. And I also have stock symbol marked as at input. But in case of stock symbol, I decided to use a setter, not just a regular property, but a setter. In JavaScript, it would be set, space, and stock symbol. In there, I do some business logic. I check if it's not undefined. What do I do? I print something on the console, and I assign the value, whatever I receive, to the stock symbol property with underscore. Typically, we name private variables with underscore. Stock symbol is here, and we bind the values to the template of the child component, just to, to, to make sure that we received properly. So through input property, this component is getting the data. What if you want to send the data out using output property? How you would do something like this? Once again, loosely coupled component. Let's go sli one slide back. This order component, it has no idea who is going to give uh, the stock symbol to buy and the quantity, right? It's absolutely loosely coupled. You can reuse it anywhere else. In this case, I show you how a component can send the data out. Once again, this component has no idea to whom the data will be sent. It just shoots the data out in the air. Whoever wants it, let them get it. Reusable component. So in this example, it's a different example. It's a, say we have a price quarter component. We have a component that knows how to connect to some stock exchange and get the latest prices maybe uh, every second. See this 1,000 milliseconds. So in this set interval, I want to repeat this code every second. Obviously, for simplicity, I don't connect to any stock exchange. What I do, I randomly, I use math random, I randomly generate prices as if they are coming from somewhere. So what do I do in, inside set interval? I, again, this code that you see over here will be repeated every second. Uh, I declare variable price quote of type I price quote. What is I price quote, by the way? On the green, on the right. I define the interface with two properties, stock symbol and latest price. I create an object. I uh, assign stock symbol, um, whatever I received, or in this case it's IBM hard-coded, and I randomly generate price. And this line, look at this. This dot last price emit. I fire an event. And inside of that event, I put an object with the value, IBM and whatever price was generated for me. I emit. How can I emit? What should I do to be able to emit? I need to declare a property and I need to mark it as an at output. This is how I say that through this variable I will be shooting out the data. This variable has to have a special type called event emitter. Event emitter knows how to emit or dispatch or fire. We use generics, right, to say that we will be emitting specific object of specific type, I price code. Once again, it's on the green. If we have this, this object, we can invoke emit on it. The name of the variable that you use becomes the name of the custom event. So the parent component should be listening to last price event. This example, this slide also has some other useful thing. I mentioned it, but I didn't have to show it. I didn't have a chance to show it to you, but now I can. See, we generate a price. We generate a price which will have multiple digits after decimal point. But it's about currency, right? So we don't want to show uh, 10 digits after decimal point. So we can use so-called pipes. So Angular comes with a bunch of pipes, which are transformers, formatters. Or you can create your own custom types if you need to. So see, we have price inside the curly braces, double curlies, which means binding. But we say, not just show me the price, but uh, take it through the pipe, give it to the currency. Currency knows how to display uh, different uh, currency types. So in this case, it would be showing me dollars and um, uh, two digits after decimal point. 
So pi is a, a vertical bar. So that's how to send the data out. Now, how the parent can receive the data that can be coming from a component. This slide shows exactly that. Once again, let's try to read and guess what's going on. In the template, I see that my component has a child, price quarter, the guy from the previous slide, and we are listening to the last price event. It's a custom event, right? So whenever we will receive that object, we want to invoke the method handler price quarter handler. And we pass an event. What's nice about it is that event handling, DOM event handling, or custom event handling is exactly the same. You always put a parentheses around the event name, and you always get an event object. In case of standard DOM event, it could be different properties, but in my case, I decided to have two properties in the event. Once again, coming back a slide, I create an object that will have stock symbol and last price. So whenever this event is received, I invoke my handler. This is a method handler. And look at this. In the arguments, I also use type. This is not possible in JavaScript, but in our case, if I make any mistakes, I immediately get help from the compiler. Very similar to Java. So I say I'm going to get an object of type iPriceQuote. From there, I extract stock symbol and light last latest price, assign them to the property of this class, and bind them to the UI. This is how parent can show that, yes, I receive uh, the price for IBM, and this is a price. Any questions so far? You have some logic in the constructor. In which constructor? Uh, here. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question was that I have some logic in the constructor, which is normally not recommended. Uh, yes, if the logic would slow down the processing. In this case, in this particular case, I invoke asynchronous method set interval. It will not slow down this constructor a bit. It will be a invoked asynchronously. So yes, if you are a purist, you can say how come you could do this, but if you are not, it doesn't affect. You can enforce in the company, of course, the rule never ever anything in the constructor, but in this particular case, it's not uh, having any negative input. Now I'll just give you like a really super high level overview of how components can communicate. There is uh, the design pattern called mediator which is probably the most important pattern for any framework uh, that is using UI, regardless if it's TypeScript, Java Swing, or Java FX, whatever. Mediator is a person in between, or an object in between. Imagine you have a family with teenagers, they don't want to talk to each other, they are arguing, so the sister talks to mom, and mom passes over the message to the browser, right? So in this example, mom is playing a role of a mediator. So components, meaning kids, can still communicate, but they do this through the mediator. And in this case, these components can have a common parent, mom, in this case. So if you look at this UI, uh, I use all these uh, figures, but it's a typical UI of any app. You have a component, you have some container, within you may have another container which has components, you may have standalone components and so on. Like in this case, number one is a top level container which has number two, which is a child of number one. Number two in turn has two components, four and five. Six is an independent component and so on. So now the question for you guys, how the number seven can send data to number six? They don't know about each other. How it's possible? Anyone? Number seven, for example, in your app, needs to pass some data to number six. How to do this? You are too advanced for this talk. You said you can do it by service. This is the next slide, and you knew about it, that I will have it. 
No, let's say we don't know. We want to use the mediator when components have common parent. We don't know anything about services. Anyone? Yes. Very good. From 7 to 3, from 3 to 1, and from 1 to 6. Look at this. Number 7 knows how to do its thing. It has no idea that it's sitting inside the container number 3 or anywhere else. It'll say it'll get the price quote. It'll shoot it out. In this particular app, number 3 will receive it, send it over, number 1 will receive it, and using binding to properties of number 6, we'll pass it over. So this is how this can be done if components have common parent, which is not always the case. And as somebody mentioned a second ago, we can use services. But first, let me finish with parents as a mediator. Typical situation, you have a parent component and two childs. On the left, you have a price quarter component. Imagine that I am a trader. I look at the screen, financial trader. And on the left-hand side, prices are flashing, blinking, whatever the latest price is of the stock that I am monitoring. And at some point, I like the price, and I want to buy. So I click on the button buy. What happens is price quarter component doesn't know how to buy, just know how to show prices. So I click on the button buy, it shoots out the event with the data. App component receives the data and using binding passes them over to order component. Order component has no idea who gave the prices, but it knows how to place orders, right? So this example shows you uh, mediator implementation through the common parent. Not always components have common parent. So let's look, look at this picture. So more generic and universal way of arranging com intercomponent communication is by using services, injectable services. On this diagram, I show you the this, this scenario where number five should pass some data to number six and number eight. As you can see, uh, number five, six, and eight don't have common parent, and in this, this is very, very realistic situation. The thing is, remember I said we have a router outlet area, and in that area we can show one component or the other. What if I need to pass data from that component to the other? The thing is that initially, say in our app, we, di we display the home component. Product A component is not in the picture. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist on the DOM. When the user will click on the title, home component will get destroyed, detached from the DOM. Product A component will be created and rendered. So that's a scenario where two components don't have common parent. They don't even exist at the same time. So using parent as a mediator is not a good idea in this case. So what can be done, we can use an injectable service. So in this case, number five, uh, six, and eight may get the same service injected. Moreover, we will be doing injection in the constructor. So I don't even care if at this given time number eight exists or not, and number six exists or not. At some point, it will be created. As soon as it's created, it gets injected the service. In the, in, in the service, you can put something. So number five can put something in the service, in the injectable service. And whenever six and eight are created, the service is injected uh, into those. So the service becomes a mediator. So it's a much more flexible way to do something like this. I don't have time to show you detailed examples, but I have a, I record some videos on YouTube. You can find it if you will go by my ID. I specifically recorded like 20, 25 minute video explaining and showing you the code how to implement this communication through the service. 
and navigation with the router. Navigation with the router again, I will just touch the, sur the surface. When you have, when you need to do routing, and you always need to do routing, uh, when we work with single page apps, the whole idea is that the code is downloaded to the computer, it's on the client already. We don't want to make requests and refresh the page on, on every move or on every click that the user may do. So what we do is we create and we declare an area called router outlet by using this tag, router outlet and closing router outlet. You can style it using CSS the way you want. And only the content in that router outlet will be changing. The toolbar stays the same. The left search bar in this example stays always, the footer stays, but that area will be changing. Moreover, you can have more than one router outlet on the page. But if you have it, you need to configure routes. In the beginning, we added router module dot for root, and we said, if the URL has nothing in the client portion of the URL, render home component. If there is a fragment slash product slash ID, render product detail component. They would be rendered in this green area, one at a time. And uh, this slide shows you a sample of route configuration. We did it already uh, when we added this. Uh, we added this route configuration in the module directly. But uh, typically and realistically, we have a separate file. In there, we declare all the routes, and then we import uh, these routes declaration in the module. There is, I need to mention this anyway, there is another consideration. How can you, how should you build an app on the client? As one module or as multiple module? And the answer is, as multiple modules, of course. Modularize your app. Don't create a huge app. The whole idea is to make sure that the landing page of your app is loaded as soon as possible. That's why there is no reason to bring the entire app if there is a menu that the user may not even click on. So, router in Angular supports so-called lazy loading of routes. So, which the code of this, uh, so what you need to do, you need to split the app into modules. For example, you can have shipping module, all functionality about shipping your product, pr product. billing module, all functionality about the billing module. So, if, when you start working on a project, you need to ask yourself, how can I split my app into separate modules? You will have root module always, plus you will have some feature module. After that, you can decide, do I want to load them eagerly whenever the app starts, or I want to load some of them lazily? That's the second question. But yes, you need to load, you need to split your app into the modules and make sure that the root module has the minimum, just the core functionality. So the app loads right away. There are uh, really good techniques of loading other modules asynchronously behind the scenes. You can specify preloading strategy, all, all is it there. But just uh, an advice, split your app. Always split your app into modules. Okay, so in the root modules, if, let me go back a slide again. So if we had routes configuration in a separate file, I created the constant routes, and I invoke router module for root in here, and I export this variable. See, I am in a separate file. Then I need to import this routing variable in the modules over here, see this? Instead of placing uh, router module for root inside the module itself, I import it from a different file. And let's say we say we want support for routes. We added router module. We did configuration of the routes. And now we need to add something to the UI. What, what if the user will click on this link? 
if we wouldn't be using Angular, if, you, if it would be a regular HTML app, we would be using anchor tag, a tag, right? With hrefs, and in there you would specify the URL. But that would be requiring communication with the server. We, we don't want this. Instead of href, look at this up on top. I use a directive router link in square brackets. And what do I uh, bind to it? In the first A link, I am saying, whenever the user will click on the home link, render the component that was configured for the case, for the case where there is nothing uh, after the service portion of the URL. If the user will click on the product detail link, render the component whatever was configured for the slash product fragment, and so on. So the user will see the links, standard links, but behind the scenes, uh, the Angular will tell which component to render. And the component is already loaded on the client. Once again, this is a router for client-side navigation. Browser has no idea about all these fancy router link and square brackets, so by the time the application is rendered, rendered it will be compiled into pure JavaScript, and all these Angular things, such as router link and square brackets, will be replaced with standard hrefs. So if you will just open up the browsers, the Chrome Dev Tools, in the Elements tab, you will see that uh, during the runtime there is no trace of router link. There are standard uh, hrefs. Passing parameter to a route. Actually, let me go back a slide. See, in this example, I have two links on top, home and product details. If I'm moving from the home component to the product detail component to show details about some product, obviously I need to pass an ID of a product. Typical situation. Not only you need to be able to navigate using the router, but you may need to pass the data over as you navigate. So, this example, this slide, shows a configuration with the parameter. So once again, let's, let's look at the route configuration. For empty fragment, you render home component, but if the URL has a fragment product slash a value, then render product detail component. So in the router link down there, we specify when the user will click on product detail, go, will go and render a component which is marked mapped to product and pass one, two, three, four over as a parameter. In this case, for simplicity, I use hard coded one, two, three, four, but it could be a property ID value and so on. And we'll do it in five minutes while generating the navigation in our store. So this is how we can send. So the router will go to the product detail component, and it'll, it creates actually a special instance of the object called activated route, which always knows what route is currently active. And this one, two, three, four will be placed inside that activated route. So the other component, the destination component, will go and say, I'm expecting an ID, give it to me, to the activated route. So the next slide shows you how the destination component can get the value that was passed to it. So what do we say, what do we see here? Product detail component has a constructor, and inside the constructor we say to Angular, please inject an instance of activated route. I need it. I expect some souvenirs. And from there, once again, there are different APIs, but what we are saying, uh, route that represents this activated route, it has a property snap, snapshot, which has a property param maps, and we say, I expect a value under the name ID. So what do you think will be the value, you, given the code in the previous slide? What will be the value here? One, two, three, four, of course. 
So this is how it's going to get this one, two, three, four. So we, we assign it to some variable. In this case, I bind this variable over here just to show that the navigation went through fine and the data is received. Okay, so now let's go back to our store where we are. We created, did we? We didn't create, we didn't finish. The, um, we need to finish the home page which will display a bunch of product item instances and when the user will click on the title inside the product item, we'll ask the router to navigate to product detail. That's the plan. So steps 1.8 to 1.10 of the menu. So let's go back to the menu. 1.8. Product item component. It's a one rectangle that represents one component. So let me copy paste the code and then I'll explain you what's what is this code about? So this the part that I highlighted is going to product item component dot ts TypeScript piece. We are going back to the product item component. This piece was generated. We don't need it. We'll replace it with with my code. As you can see on line eleven, I have a property marked with an, with an annotation at input. So you can guess that apparently a parent component will provide a value of type product. Who is the parent? The parent will be the home component for these product items. Now, UI. This product item is supposed to show somehow the information about the product. Right? And that's the next piece. Next piece in the instructions, we use standard HTML5 text figure, which allows you to specify an image and some text. Figure is for an image, and fig caption is for the text under the image. Instead of real images, I am using this nice handy site called placehold.it. It's a very nice site that allows you to, uh, to get... It, it'll give you this... Uh, gray squares of the size that you specify. So in, for prototyping, it's, it's very convenient instead of using real images. So in this case, I'm saying, give me a square of type 320 by 150 pixels. So that will be my image, right? Now, what else? Look at this piece. I have a title, product title, product title. Once again, in the TypeScript piece, we expect to receive the product object from the parent. Product object has different properties, one of them being title. So what I'm saying in HTML, I'm saying uh, over here, show me the product title. But it's a part of the link, a tag. Inside that link, I am using the navigation with Angular Router. I am saying go I mean, change the URL to be product followed with uh, product.id. That's exactly what we configured for the route. So now this title becomes clickable, and the router will see, what should I render if I have product slash one, two, three, four? Oh, I should render product detail, fine. So it'll replace, product, replace home component in the router outlet with product detail component. Up on top, not up on top, over here I show the product price using pipe with currency, and over here I show short, descri uh, short description. So that's HTML for product item component. Going back, product item component, product item works, no, no more, this piece. The code is recompiled, but I don't expect to see anything new in the store. Why? Because the, I didn't finish the home component. Home component is the one that will use the service, that will grab the data and pass the data to product item component. So the next step is to do the home component. Any questions so far? No questions. Very good. Either you're too smart or I'm doing a great job. 
you pick. All right. So now the home component. Actually, one more thing. I, mm, I want to add just little margin. Uh, I will have a bunch of these rectangles. I want to add some spacing around it. So this is, I added some simple styles for the element of type uh, figure. I need to put it in the product item component CSS. Somebody asked me during the break, oh man, what happened? Something is misformatted. Let me do it again. I don't know why then. It's not what? Oh, of course, of course, I'm, pa I'm pasting HTML into a CSS file. Stupid me, I didn't copy it properly. Yeah, that's better. All right, still we, don't, we won't see anything new on the UI until we'll finish the home component. Now the home component, check it out. I am injecting our product service, right? In the constructor of home component. And in there, I make a request to, to do get product. And uh, now I can enter the comment that I had earlier about placing or not placing the code in the constructor. In this case, I'm using a method ng on init. Angular comes with the a whole bunch of so-called lifecycle hooks that are invoked at certain place. In particular, ng on init is invoked after constructor when the property of the component are initialized. Uh, that's why I um, put the code to make request for data in the ng on init. It will be called on my component by Angular. ng on init is a method that is typically used for fetching data. And this is what I do over here. So I invoke get products. Hopefully the data will come back. I have hard coded data. And I'll place them in the variable product, which is a array of type products, right? And then I'll use it in the HTML. But first, let's uh, modify the TypeScript. So this is a home component.ts. Home component somewhere up there. Yep, home component.cs. This was generated piece. I replace it with my code. And now HTML. HTML. So this will be the HTML for the home component. Let me explain you what's in there. ng4. This is a directive from Angular that knows how to loop through the collection of data and repeat fragments of HTML. Let's see, I have a div, and I'd say ng4, let product of products. Let product means I declare uh, local variables to use in the uh, loop to iterate the products. Product is an array that we declared a minute ago inside the component right there, and hopefully it is populated with data. So I'm saying, I don't know how many products you have, but for each product, for each product, it renders this diff. So it'll repeat it for each and every product. So what do we see here? Inside the product, inside this div, I have my product item component. And I am passing the current product. As we iterate through the array of products, we are passing for each uh, for each app product item, we are passing one particular product. What else is in here? I already mentioned that before, but let me do it again. And I actually, I, I think I have somewhere a note in, the, in there. Call SM4, LG4, MD4. This is from Bootstrap. You can specify different layouts for different uh, sizes of the screen. 
For example, small is, is I believe, a device which is 600 or less pixels width. Medium is, I don't remember, I think uh, 1024 width pixels, something like this. So you can specify a different number of columns for different screen sizes. But the point is that NG4 is a directive that loops through the data and render this piece, the piece where it's declared in. Class row, it's also from Bootstrap. So let's go back and make it HTML of the home component. Home works, no more, save. Now I expect to see a different UI. Let's see if this is the case. My store devops, and this is the case. See that? So it loops, so what happened? Home component got the product service injected. It invoked a method get product, received an array of products, right? And inside of HTML, using ng4, asterisk ng4, it rendered these pieces. It happened to be six products. That's why it rendered six. It would be more, it would be more. Do you have questions so far? No. Look at this. Remember I said that the product title will be a link, clickable link, right, with the router. And it is a link. Uh, you probably can't see, but all the way at the bottom you see the URL under this link, localhost 4200 product slash zero. If I will go over here, it's product slash one, I, product ID one. Let's try to click. What do you think I will see if I will click on it? Do I see anything? Yes or no? What? Exactly. I will see a message product detail works. That's what was generated for product details. Click. See, the router outlet area was replaced. The, the product tail component was rendered. It's not exactly what we want to see, but the whole mechanics works, right? Do you understand how it works? I hope so. So what's left? We need to replace the product detail. It's a piece of cake. Let's do it. Let's go by the book. I explain all these things a little bit over here. And we see exactly what's needed. I have this little sidebar explaining these call SM, call LG, and so on. I, I also want to tell you once again, we try to use angular material components, not bootstrap. We use, in our uh, real-world projects, we use Angular Material Library, and for layout and for responsive layout, we use a library called Flex Layout. So we use these two instead of Bootstrap. Okay, so anyway, so our screen looks beautiful. You can't argue that. But let's see if it's responsive. Right? So this is what I suggest you to do in the instructions. Let's see how it, what will change if the screen size is different, screen width. What if I will look at this store in the smartphone? Let me go back. Where is my store? I will open up the Chrome Dev Tools. And in there, this is an old message, no worries, let me erase it. In here, you see this little toggle button, toggle device toolbar. I click on it. See, it shows me for the size 320 by 578, this is how my, my app will look like. Product detail, actually, why am, am I on product detail works? Let me go back to the home component, actually. See, look at this. On the small device, it'll be 
allocated one before, one below the other. Or let me change it a little bit. Let me pick iPhone 6 Plus. Still, it's not big enough. Let me pick iPad Pro. See, on the iPad Pro, it'll look like this. You can even try to play with landscape and so on. You can enter specific um, sizes if you want. So you can always uh, check um, how it's going to look like on different devices. It is important, and uh, I suggest you to have on staff uh, a web designer who prepare for you the prototype for the site and not only for the desktop version. Typically, you ask for three prototypes. How it looks on the big screen, on the small screen, small uh, is iPad, and on the on the uh, phones. Okay, so we are fine for now, and now we need to finish the pro retail component. Pro retail component is pretty simple. It's pretty simple. What what do we need in there? The pro retail component is supposed to receive a parameter. Remember, we click on some product title and we are passing product ID to this guy. This parameter, during navigation with the router, parameters are passed through that activated route um, component. In this case, I am injecting it, right? I am saying, you're going to need it. And also what I, I inject, I inject my product service. What for? So a product detail component can make a request and receive details using the API get product by ID. Remember we have it in the service? There are different ways uh, of doing this. If on the home component I would have all the data about the product, I could, I could have just passed the existing object product to this guy. So it will not need to uh, request the services data. But over here for exercise I decided to inject product services as well. So the product so this component is saying give me the product ID parameter. I am expecting something in the product ID property in the activated route. It's gonna get it. And it will invoke the method get product by ID on the service. This is how it's going to work. That's the TypeScript piece. And then we'll do the HTML portion. Product detail component, which is there. Replacing the code, saving, recompiled. And now HTML. HTML is also pretty simple. I, I use, again, figure class. Title will be shown here, price, product description. We had short description, now we have long description, product rating, and categories, which category it belongs to. By the way, take a look. In this LI, I create an ordered list, and inside of that LI, I use ng4 again. I don't know how many categories is in this particular product. I loop through that array to render them as an item in the list. So this is going to be my UI for product detail. Product detail component, HTML. Let's see if it changed the UI. Uh, the store is here. Click. Now I see the details. It works. Uh, and finally, uh, this is this is all gray. I want to make it a little nicer. So what I will do, I will just add just a little bit of styling. This is a figure a tag, figure element. I will just color them a little bit. First of all, I will add some uh, one relative uh, item on the top. For H4 elements, I want to make them blue. And for H5 elements, I want to make them brown. I have them over here. CH5s are these, and title is H4. So I will just copy-paste this piece in the CSS 
of the component. CSS of the component is here. Save. See, it's even show you the color, the ID. Going back here, it fails to compile. See, it doesn't like something. Copy paste error. One doesn't belong there. Save. See, now it's beautiful. Look at these colors. It's not gray anymore. Do you enjoy it? Do you like the UI? Come on, guys. You, like three hours ago, you didn't even know anything about Angular. Now the app is working. Hmm? It's perfect. Different story. Thank you very much. Thank you. See, I, in, my, in my opinion, it's pretty impressive. Not my work, but what you can do. Obviously, you need to learn these things, but it's 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 productive framework. I mean, people who move from Java background to JavaScript background, they suffer, and I was one of them. But moving to TypeScript is a different story. I mean, it's very natural for us. We understand what's going on. And one gentleman during the break mentioned this, and I also think it would be a pain point, CSS. So most of Java developers have no clue what it is, how to make it nice, all these rounded corners, and how to style it, and it started to different sizes of the fonts, and it doesn't fit. You will spend some time in there, but uh, TypeScript is very natural. So we are, we are done with this part. I just want to tell you I just want to tell you that we can change this app to remove hard-coded data about products and to hit, it, hit the server, actually. Uh, I'll be doing this tomorrow. And I will repeat this, a short version of this presentation tomorrow uh, during the 45-minute slot. But in there, I will start the Spring Boot server, and I will be hitting that server. But I want to tell you how you can do this. Because I prepared the instructions for tomorrow's short session as well. And you have the code already, and you have instructions. But first, you, before I'm showing you where you can find them, let me ask you this. We created a product service with hard-coded data. If I will ask you, what do you need to do to hit the server to remove hard-coded data. What would you do? Let's think about product service. What do we do with the product service? A, we hard-coded the data in there, and B, we inject it into component or components, right? If, what would you need to do if I will tell you, you know what, Java guys created a server for us, now we can grab the data from there. No, more, no need to no need to use hard-coded data. What would you start with? REST. What? REST. Yeah, it's REST API. No, I understand that it's REST. Uh, they would give you endpoints, similar to this one, like slash product ID or slash product. So what would you do? Say it again. I've heard the word inject. That's correct. First of all, I would create another class. Remember I said that dependency injection allow us to easily switch what to inject. Imagine that whatever we just did with the product service was a mock product service. And now Java team tells us we have a real thing. Great, so I will create a new class. I will generate it or create it, a real product service. I will not have anything hard-coded in there. There are two methods, get product and get product by ID. In each of those, uh, you said correctly, we would need to make HTTP request, HTTP get. We know the endpoints, right? So in that real product service, we would need to inject HTTP client. And on that object, we would need to say HTTP, get and hit that endpoint. The rest remains the same. Uh, of course, given the fact that you have this, uh, the server up and running. 
And now let me show you where you where you can see that and do it on your own. At the end of this uh, of these instructions, I have PSS. If you want to run the server version, you need to open up the folder Angular for Java Devs. In there, there is another file with instructions. And in that file, and you have it, if you will download it, uh, the whole handouts from the Git, from GitHub, there is a folder Angular for Java Devs. This is what I will use tomorrow. And in there, there is a file called uh, my store Spring Boot HTML. I'm using ASCII docs. So th these instructions start with, I mean, this part is the same, but it starts with how to start the this, this Spring Boot server. There is a folder server in there. It's ready to go, very simple Spring Boot app. So open it up in ID in the, your IDE or just run on the command line MVM Spring Boot run and it'll start the server with uh, on port 8080 with the data which is exactly the same JSON it'll return. And then again you develop you, this part you understand already and uh, this all this is the same. The only difference will be with the service, the product service. The interface product is the same, but look at this. This service will not have hard-coded data anymore. We inject, in there we inject uh, HTTP client over here, see this? And then we use it. If you want to go through this file, uh, I also want to stress that I, I'm dealing with a special situation which, which we always use during development. We have a REST server written in some technology, let's say Spring Boot, up and running on port 8080. On the other hand, I have a convenience of my little dev server that comes with Angular, the one that was doing all these builds, hot reload and everything. I want to keep it, right? So we have a situation. And what is the situation? I have a local little dev server that builds and serves my app on the port 4200, correct? And I will have a REST server on port 8080, my Spring Boot server, right? So now we have a situation that kind of violates so-called same origin policy, meaning what? My app came from the server on port 4200 and if I will start making requests to the other guy, to the other server that runs on port 8080, we got a situation. It's not allowed unless that server will configure special headers or an easy way out is to create a nice and little file called proxy config in the Angular project and started with this proxy config saying, whenever you see certain fragment in the URL, for example, slash API and then slash product, slash API, then redirect it to the local host 8080 where your Spring Boot runs. And now we resolve the situation. What happens is the server that runs on port 4200 sends me the UI. I hit the server back but since the URL has API slash something, that dev server talks to the Spring server, which is allowed. And uh, this is a typical scenario how we work, and this is what I suggest for you to do. Have a REST server somewhere and have your own dev server that serves your uh, Angular apps and builds and everything. Do you understand this? I explain this in here, in the in the instructions, and if you want, by the way, um, back in March, I think, there was a DevOx US. In DevOx US, I was delivering a short presentation, uh, Angular 4 for Java developers. It's recorded, it's on YouTube, it's like 45 minutes, and I was explaining that example. I'm telling you as if I don't want you to come over 
tomorrow to my presentation. So, I mean, there are plenty of nice uh, speakers, so go there. Uh, especially you already know all this material. But watch that presentation. I explain all this with uh, Spring Boot and uh, Web Dev in Angular. Any questions? You have a contract using Swagger or something. You can integrate a client into this? The question was if I have a contract using Swagger, can you integrate it easily? The answer is yes. And as a matter of fact, I need to mention another great product. Uh, yesterday, these guys did the deep dive. Most likely there will be some um, video. Maybe they will do more. There is a product called JHipster. Have you heard of this? So JHipster is a, a code generator that generates Angular on the front, Spring on the back, different architecture. You can generate monolithic uh, app on the server. You can generate microservices. I mean, you name it. Docker deployment. It, it is really good product. It's an open source product, and I recommend you to look at it. JHipster. And they use Swagger under the hood as well. No more questions? Yes? How do I debug? Oh, easily. Just I go to the browser. I go to the browser. I have something broken, of course. Let me see. Uh, basically, what happened is when you, it was not me, uh, no, my app was not broken. My app wor works fine. Let me turn off the thing. When you generate bundles in Angular, it also generates so-called uh, source map files. If you look at the, um, it doesn't show, it doesn't show here. No, but it does generate source map files. What are these files for? They are used to map the source code in TypeScript to source code in JavaScript. So when you load the app, source maps comes in when you open up the Chrome Dev panel and you see the TypeScript code and you just place breakpoints in there as it was normal ones. Even though it runs JavaScript, it also has the source map, so you just debug TypeScript inside the browser console. You would need to go somewhere here to the sources tab and under the webpack. Webpack, they, by the way, they use under the hood, they use the bundler called webpack. I mean, Angular CLI when it generates. Somewhere in there, there is a folder that looks like empty. If you will scroll down, you will find the code of your app with SRC and the app and all the components are there, see? And TypeScript, you can put breakpoints in there just as you would with JavaScript, even though it runs JavaScript. So you can debug it nicely, really convenient. This is what we usually do. So do I have anything in there? I already explained you all that. Actually, I have a couple of more slides explaining HTTP client. And I, yes. Observable, you mean? Yes. See, I didn't have time for this to mention this, but there is a library called RxJS, which is uh, included with, live, with Angular and all HTTP requests return you an observable and you have to subscribe to it. There are different types of builds. Uh, I don't have time with you, but that's all. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>